we welcome you here. That you guys are online. We welcome everybody in the building. We've we've met since ten and been praying together, worshiping together, praising the Lord together, and talking. And um, you this online. I got a precious card from one of our sisters down in Houston. And she said you've got Christian gathering in Houston, and she wrote us a beautiful card to the church. I should have brought it and read it to you. That she's been online, and one of the one time that she wrote in there, she said, "This has changed my life." Amen. You know what? It don't always look like you think it's going to look for lives to be changed. The truth of God's word has been going out across the airways, not just from Christian gathering, but from many sources. You see, God loves all of His people. He loves all those. He knows those that are shut in, that those that can't come, or those that's been hurt. And I talked at the end of the year, those that are wounded, those that have been wandering around, that's weary, those that's been hurt by church, and they just like, I'm never doing that again. But at some point, they get really weary and go, you know what? I need more than what I have. I need a family. I need more than my natural family. Some people don't even have that, but there's a place at the table. The last message I preached, you've been online, and, and if you haven't, I encourage you to go watch those last messages about coming to the table. That you have a place, you have a family, you're welcome, you have a seat at the table. It's not as much as about what's on that table. It's about having a place at the table. Not, I realize I'm not talking in the microphone. I guess I'm supposed to be doing that. <laughs> Forgive me if you couldn't hear me, so... Read my lips. <laughs> you know what? Don't you? Aren't we glad that God doesn't wait for us to get it all right and be all proper and perfect? Aren't we glad that He uses us right where we are? I was telling Brother Chris this week. I was reminding him. Sometimes He uses us best when we feel like we're at our worst. How many of y'all have ever experienced that? And when that happened, you go, "Ooh, that sure wasn't me." That had to be God. <laughs> he gets all the credit. But I know there's people out there that are, have been wandering around. Don't even, some people don't even know Jesus. And some people think they know Jesus. They said, well, that ain't the Jesus I thought. If that's how Jesus is, I don't want it. Because they got confused with what we call Christianity and Jesus the Christ. Jesus, look at Jesus, what he did. Let's get beyond all of those things that we've added to him. What he's calling us to right now, there's a, there is a reset that's been happening. There is a restoration of the order of God, the order of God's service. And that's what I intend, I had invent, I had here as the, the title of my message, but I just changed it. <laughs> they just said, what do you want to say? And I'm like, okay. Aren't we glad that, you know, that's what following the spirit is really about. He'll just mess with our stuff. We can think we have it down. Every time I think I have it down. I can say, I have a good plan. How many of y'all ever had a good plan? And then you realize God had a better plan. But you know what? We are after, he, he sees our heart. That good plan, the Bible says a man devises his ways, but the Lord directs his step. We need to devise our ways. We're not people that don't have any plans. It don't mean we're not planning on going to work tomorrow or going to school or going and going buy groceries. That's okay, but whatever I do, I commit my plans and say, now, Lord, you direct my steps. Because I maybe think I'm needing to go to Walmart, but he may have somebody he needs me to talk to at Tom Thumb. And I don't know why I didn't get over to Walmart and I ended up at Tom Thumb. And then I'm standing in line next to somebody and I realize that somebody needed the hope that was in me. The hope that Brother James talked about last week. The last message of the year was about hope. And I believe it's the first message today. It's, it's all in here in what the Lord has given us to start the new year. There's no stop and start. It's just a continuation. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? This thing is line upon line, precept upon precept. This is not like, well, I got to get a little standalone sermon this week, a little standalone sermon. Well, you can do that, but I'm telling you what he's been flowing with me. This is not just a sermon. This is a building of principles and building of concepts he's been bringing us to so that we can see him more clearly. And I realize I did not dismiss the children for Sunday school, so you're welcome to do that if you'd like to do that now. Thank you, Sister Grace, for just getting up and taking care of business. This is a family around here. If you want to get involved in children's ministry, this is a good way to do it. Yes. And next week we'll have youth Sunday school. Uh, and uh, but today you are having Sunday school. You just I get to be your teacher. Aren't y'all glad? <laughs> Say bless Sister Pam. <laughs> Say it like you mean it, loud and proud. Wow. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hope. 
hope as we talked, as Brother James talked last week. We have a hope. Well, I actually posted a, a little a, a picture, a little, I took a little uh, a picture of a piece of paper that Pastor Gary had written on. And it just fell out on the floor. I don't know where it came from. I just have to believe the angel had it holding it there for such a time as this. But I picked up, I wish I'd have brought it with me, but I did post it on our family Facebook page. And he had written on there some words that when I picked it up, I remember when he had given those words. And I knew it was for me and I've held on to it, but it didn't seem to really go to anybody else at that time. And then when I looked at it, I realized after listening to Brother James's message, Last week, and knowing that we're going into a new era, uh, I'm not saying a new season. This is a whole new era. This is a this is a new. Y'all know that we, America's there. We're there in many many ways. The church is there as a whole, the body, and it's an exciting thing. But um, let me see. I think I topped it out here. What he said. Yes. What was on his handwritten little note? It said, "An anchor is only as good as you plant it." The hope which, uh, and our anchor has already been tested. It's up to us to trust it. Well, he'd given me that note. It was the week after our family had just been turned upside down by a word called suicide. There's no word like that that can totally change everything. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Death at any point, but challenging your faith is that one. Yes, because there's a million whys. And how can we get through this? How can we go on? And the Lord had told Gary that an anchor is only as good as you plant it. And our anchor has already been tested. It's up to us to trust it. And I realized then that I knew our family, that we had been tested many times if we ever got here. And that our anchor had been planted deep. I knew when I got that, I was like, okay, I didn't like it. <laughs> but I knew that it was the truth. That we had, our faith had been anchored in the Lord. Even way back from, to my grandmother. My mom and daddy as kids, our grandkids. And now we've lost one of the granddaughters. Young, beautiful. Boy, are you talking about needing an anchor? Something you can just hold on to. That keeps you. You may have been fishermen or been a boat. You know what that anchor means. But you know when there's an anchor that's been, it's deep. It's down in there. It holds. He said, but the anchor's already been tried. It's up to you to trust it. I don't know where we're going in 21. We didn't know where we were going in 20. But we look at the word we got at the beginning. What did the Lord tell Gary then? He said, he said you're going to expand without expending. Have we not done that? Oh, look around. Well, there's, you know, most people's at home today. It's okay. We have, how many of y'all have, yourself has been expanded? How many of you, your vision has been expanded? Your faith has had to, you've had to dig some holes. That anchor's had to been going deep this year. We've not expended. We've had less electricity to pay because we've had less gatherings. We've had less, a lot of stuff. But the truth is the gospel, like my little sister that wrote from Houston that said, my life has been changed because I found you on the, on, on, on the internet. I found you. It's one of Brandon's friends. He hooked up. He, how many of y'all can hook up your friends and go, you don't have to come to Gainesville. You can get online and, and listen because I think my pastor has something you might need to hear. I'm not supposed to be for everybody, but there's some people, people. That are meant to hear our voice. Some people are meant to hear your voice. Do you believe that? So it's you planning. It. And so we say these things. So he said, it's already been tested. It's up to us to trust it. And so um, I found that. And then I come in here. And then I don't remember if it was before the messenger went after. But when I started thinking about that. And I was thinking about Brother James's message. We're building off of that about the hope. And I'm not going to try to reteach it. But hoping that he did a great job. And it's expecting things to come. It's what you have. that it's, And, he, and I, I thought of this scripture. I don't know if he read this. But Hebrews 6, 18 to 20. This connects these two about this anchor. And about this hope business that I'm talking about. Because he says. He said. Um. We have this a strong consolation. There's a consolation you need to have today. You need to tell your friends and people that don't have that anchor. There's a strong consolation. He said that God cannot lie. And his promises are true and amen. You need to know that. He said, and let this be. He said, lay hold on the hope that's set before us. It's set up before us. The, uh, the question is, are you going to lay hold on it? James asked us last week, he said, what is you, what do you hope? What's your hope? 
He just said a question. He just let it hang. What are you hoping for this year? I don't know if y'all answered it, you thought about it. But this is, he goes, let us lay hold upon the hope that's set before us. It's already there. It's, it's, a ta- it's on the table. It's on the table. This is a place you can put it all on the table. He's put it all on the table. On the cross, we just did communion together. He put it all on the table that day. He said, it's all there. The table spread, it's on the table. And this is on the table. There's hope on the table. He said, it's set before us. He said, which hope we have that is an anchor of the soul. Both sure and steadfast. That entrance into that which was within the veil. Now, I'm going to talk about in a minute because I never really talked about that part. I always stopped at this. He's an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. Now, let me say this to you. What does that mean, an anchor to the soul? What is your soul? See, I kind of thought, well, if I just keep my faith in Jesus, it's going to be an anchor. I'm going to make heaven someday. No, this didn't say it's an anchor to the spirit. It says it's an anchor to the soul. You ever feel like, see people say, I'm about to lose my ever-loving mind. I don't know what that means, but you know, but you know what I'm talking about. My anchor's fixing to come undone. <laughs> don't make me. <laughs> don't make me. He said, this hope that you have in the promises of God, he told you I'll never leave you, forsake you. He tells you you can come and ask for wisdom. He'll give it. Whatever your favorite promises are, he said, let it be a hope. He said, it'll be an anchor to your soul. That means that's your mind, your will, and emotion. It'll keep you from losing it. Amen. When you feel like you're losing your mind, you're losing your peace, you're losing your faith, you're just losing it. He said, I've set a hope before you. It's right here before you need to lay a hold on that. But then there was something real important that jumped out. And I'm read King James, you know. Uh, it said, it's sure and steadfast, which entereth into that which is within the veil. Okay, well, what's that about? Well, uh, I want to read. Let me, before I go, let me read this scripture right here. I found this one. I added this. This about losing your soul or anchor to your soul. It's Matthew 16, 26 says, if a man, what is a man profit if he games the whole world and loses his own soul? What would he give in exchange for his soul? For another one, Luke says, what is a man's advantage if he gained the whole world and he lose himself? He'd be a castaway. I used to think that, what if you gain the whole world and you did, then you still just went to hell? I thought that was about that. I, I missed the soul part. What if you gained everything and you still have no peace of mind? What if you have the biggest house? There's people that own buildings they jump off of. They gain. They gain the building. They gain. They're the CEO in the, in the penthouse. What if you gained everything and you still lost your mind, your peace, your emotions? What if you get to that point and you have everything in this world, but you still, if not, you lose your soul. You lose your mind. He said that you lose yourself. That's not the scripture, but it's a good one. Maybe I told you the wrong one. That was, uh, what was it? I've lost my place because I'm not in line here. I'm just speaking. Holy ghost. That's a, I hope y'all get that right there. Luke 9.25 says, For what is a man advantage if he's gained the whole world and lose himself or be a castaway? You know what, there's that time that you can just lose it. And he said, but here's how you do it. The Amplified Version said, this hope that we have is an anchor of the soul. It cannot slip or break down under pressure. It's safe and it's steadfast that enters within the veil. And then it says this about this veil business. Of the heavenly temple, that most holy place, which is where the very presence of God dwells. It says this hope reaches behind the curtain. Okay, I gotta stop right there. What is he saying when he says that this hope enters, it goes beyond the veil or it reaches past the veil? Boy, he brought me to that. What is behind the veil? The behind the veil is what they knew, the Jews knew this, because they knew very well the tabernacle of God. 
anybody studied anything about the Old Testament very long, you're going to know about the tabernacle or the temple where they came in. And it's very important to understand this because I'm going to get, there is an order that God is restoring. And I used to put my board up here and draw it. So you just have to imagine it in your mind if you don't know about this tabernacle. It's the place where God gave his people that they could get into this place where they could. They had all these purposes in it. But the ultimate purpose is God was going to come heaven to earth. He was going to come down with his Shekinah glory. There was a place called the Holies of Holies. It was behind a veil. And it was where the mercy seat lie, lay. And the promises of God was in this little box they called the Ark of the Covenant. It was a box where it represented the promises to God's people. That hope that they had. Remember Aaron's bud, Aaron's rod that budded. Remember why God gave you leadership. The Ten Commandments. Remember God gave you his word. He gave you leadership. Remember each one of these things, that uh, the manna that he provided for you. That was that communion we took today to remind you. That was their communion. That was their reminder. It was behind this veil. But you got to remember, there was a veil, but there was another. There was three parts to this building. Everything in the kingdom, and I can't go into it, but it's in threes. I'm telling you, everything's in three. Body, soul, spirit, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, faith, hope, and love. And it just goes on and on and on and give you a list, and I read them sometime around here. But this tabernacle was outer court, inner court, and holies of holies. And the way you entered into that with the door, which is we know what the door is today. The door is Jesus, right? It's he provided a door that everybody could come and whosoever will. But when you walked in that outward place, it's where most of we come, it's where you come to the Lord. The first thing you saw in that, in that place was this altar. And that's where they slayed the, the animals and the blood. And they had to do that over and over and over. And then there was a lava. There was this bowl of water with a mirror. You could look at yourself and all this. They washed themselves and then they could go into the next dimension which was the inner court. But, but the first thing they had to know, it's first things first. And I'd say God is restoring order. They said, I'm going to get back to this veil because this is why you bring your hope. This is why the hope yeah. is. This is, why we're go this is where we're going. He's restoring some things. But the first thing you did, you walked in or now, spiritually speaking, we can, walk, we can walk right past that altar and go, oh, that's the cross. Jesus is my ultimate sacrifice. He said they had to do it over and over. But now he said once and for all, he came down and laid down his own life. That, we, that That's already over. There's none of this killing a bunch of animals and, and all that stuff. He said, I will be once for all. I took away the sin problem. Here you go. It's, it's, I did that. And once you receive that, like they did, they did that. They had to do it. We don't do it. Jesus did it for us. He became our sacrifice. Then you walk over here and there's a lava of water. And they could wash their hands and wash. They looked at, they'd seen themselves clean. That's baptism for us. That's when we go over there and go, now, I receive what he did. And by saying I received that, I'm going to look in there and know I have been made clean by the blood of the lamb. And so now he said, baptism's an answer to a good conscience. So now I can look and say, whoo, because of what he did. Now I, he died. And as he died and buried and rose again, so now I'm going to be buried in baptism. And that's, that's what I do. This is what we do together. I go and I get baptized. That's how we act it out. We believe, then we walk over here and we walk this out. And we say, now I want to wash this away. I'm, he was buried. I want to be buried with him and rise to walk in newness of life. So that's what that was. And then you went from there to the next dimension is where most of us live. Thank God. Thank God we went in the door. Thank God we have those things. We have that, right? That's where Jesus became that savior. But then there's another dimension that we actually call church. Because in this part of the building, this part of the tabernacle was other pieces of furniture. Three things majorly. Again, you have this, these things. You had this, ooh, you had this table of showbread. This bread. What does he represent? Jesus is the bread of life. It's the word of God. It's the written word. It's the rhema word. It's word that you get there. You're getting some of that hopefully right now. It's so you go in that next dimension and you get the word. And over here, there was a candlestick that had oil and there was a fire at the top of it that brought light. We've been talking about fire and light, right? And that's the spirit of God. You had spirit, the Holy Ghost. You come in here and you receive these things until so you have bread and you have spirit. And then you walk over here. And, but there's another altar. And there's an altar right before that veil. It's called the altar of incense. What is that? Thank you, brother. I'm going to get first things first here. I'm going to talk to you. You first of all, you got to go through what Jesus did. Believe what he did. That was in the outer court. That's what he did for us. But we received that. We believe that. That's our part. To believe that part, what he did. The second part is we come together. Now it's a we. We enjoy. They had to make 
the oil. They had to beat the olives. They had to grow the olives, make all. That's what the priests did all the time, keep that lamp burning all the time. There was work to do in there. They had to make the bread. They had to grow the wheat. They had to do all that stuff. There was stuff. That, so the priesthood did all that stuff for them. That's the ministry to the church. They have things we knew. We do teach Sunday school. We do preach messages. We do love and go and feed the poor, do all these things. So we have something to do. That's the we part in that part. That's the we. Out here's me receiving him. And here it's we working together with the word. And, the, and then there's that altar of incense. And it wasn't just one thing they did. It was a combination. The apothecary brought together a priest. And they brought a little bit of this, a little bit of this. And each one of those represents a part of prayer. Because brother, brother, our brother Charlie just said he jumped, he just snitched me out right there. Just jumped the gun. He gave us a, it, he says, and you probably already knew this. But what the incense is, is the prayers of the saints. No, if and buts about it. And let me just give you, I'll give you three scriptures. Let's go to the Old Testament, Psalms 141 and 2. He said, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. Now, there's a big little word there, and it's as. And you're going to find this out throughout the Bible. Brother Hambidge says it's the like as principle. Over and over, you'll see it's like as. It's not this, it's like this. Like as. He was like a, a lamb led to the slaughter. There's, li there's like as in the Bible. These are things he gives us that we, pictures that we can understand the spiritual into, in, by natural things. He said, this is what it's like. He said, let my prayers be set forth before you, set forth before you, set forth before you as incense. And the lifting up of my hands be as the evening sacrifice. You see how those went together? Sacrifice. This was an altar. Altars were only, that's what they were. They were sacrifice, places of sacrifice in the Bible. He says, again in Revelations 8 and 3, he says, another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given to him much incense. Where was the angel? Is before the altar. He had a golden censer which given to him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden arch, art, altar which was before the throne. Can you visualize that right now? You guys that were praying this morning, you that were on your knees, you that were sitting in your seats, you how are you doing that? Visualize what's happening. This is a big deal which was before the throne. And, number, and then uh, 8 and 4 says, And the smoke of the incense, which came up with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Can you imagine today that your prayers, the angels, it says they take them two places and carry them before the throne. That's that altar. And in that, if you want to study it, we're not going to do an in-depth study on prayer today, but this is a big deal because God has called us to prayer. Amen. There's a new call. I'm walking in it. You can fall if you want to. I'm telling you, this is where it's at. This is what's happening. Because beyond the veil, there's something we're all looking for, which is the Shekinah presence of God where it has nothing to do with you. It's all about Him. But before you go there, you need to understand this. God is a God of order. And when there's order, you don't need any control. Control is something people do to try to keep order. Religion tried to control people to keep the order. They, they, uh, uh, pastors and preachers and people and religious people tried. They had a good idea. They thought this is what God needed you to do. So let's try to, let's try to control you. Number one, we control people with fear. Turn or burn. We try to control people with fear. Jesus ain't gonna like that. I'm telling you, I, I, that just it just does something in me. I, we had a, we had some people here doing a, a Sunday school, uh, not, I mean, a children's crusade, and a little kid did something, and that leader said, "Don't do that, Jesus. Don't like that." Ooh, hair stood up back of my neck. It ain't got nothing to do with Jesus liking that. Your mom ain't going to like it, and I don't like it. So go by the rules. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible loves me, tells me so. And if you can act like a little jerk, he still loves you. And we taught this stuff to our kids, and we're still teaching it to our kids. It's the wrong image of God. 
And he says, it's time to adjust some things. He told me this, the first word I got for this year was alignment. Amen. Now, if anybody goes to chiropractors, you know about getting, a, you're getting an alignment. They'll tell you, you're not in alignment. They'll lay you down, and measure your feet. And yeah, you're off right here. And they'll say, you need an adjustment to get you in alignment. I know this because I've been going to them lately. You know what? And you know what? They got me in alignment and I, I'm not having to go anymore. And it got me back flowing. And if you look, there's a little uh, a chart on the wall that'll show the spine. And it'll have a little, and they'll say, this, is, this vertebrae affects your liver. This over here affects your, your blood flow or your heart. They're all, we, in other words, everything that happens in this body is connected. If you're not in alignment, your blood may not be able to get there. There's a blockage. It's not really flowing right. You don't know why you're aching there. You don't know why you're out of alignment. Because you need to get in alignment because every single thing in God's body is important just like this body. If you have a pinched nerve, your hand's not going to, not only going to have pain, but you got, you sometimes you just got where you can't even walk. You can't even use it. We're, because we're not in alignment. That's the brain. That's, that's something that's stopping the brain flow to us. That's between us and God. God is our brain, right? He's the heart. And so there's some things he said, I need to get in alignment because if you don't get it, it's going to stop the flow and there's going to be some unhealthy parts. He's ready for us to go out. Oh my gosh, he told me at the end of the year, the church is fixed to go out. It's fixed to go out. And then he says, you got to get alignment and you got to get in order because if you're going to send out the army, they got to have, y'all, this military, you know, you got to have some order. People can't just be running everywhere. You're going to get friendly fire. It ain't very friendly when it feels that way. The truth is you, we have friendly fire in the church. Thank you, Lord, for that one. I ain't thought of that before. We're supposed to be shooting the enemy. We're shooting each other. It's friendly fire. We might not have meant to do it, but we've done it for years. And it's people wounded by friendly fire. We didn't mean to. And you feel bad when you know you did it. I speak from experience. I've learned that getting amends, making amends. I didn't have, need the 12 steps for that one. Holy Ghost told me about making amends a long time ago. At some point, you're going to have to make amends because we're all going to mess up. We've got to go back and say, I didn't do that right. I could have done it better. I'm sure glad I didn't publish the books I've been writing because I'd already said, burn them books. Because <laughs> I have changed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I've learned. I'm still growing. I'm glad I didn't publish some of that stuff because it just wasn't quite right. Some of it might have been friendly fire. I didn't even know it. I was doing it trying to save people. I forgot I'm not their savior. <laughs> He's the savior. He told the church, oh, you got to go out and save the people. No, he didn't. He never told you to save nobody. He said, you go out and love people. I'll do the saving, you do the loving. Ooh, that, okay, Lord. I'm all over this paper. Hope I hope I'm making sense, but I, I like that friendly fire business. I'm right, that start, right there. I've been a victim of friendly fire. We probably all have. Beyond the veil. Okay, this, that second dimension is where you have these things that we call church. Very important. Every dimension is very important. You've got to have all three of the rooms. This is the order, though. There's an order. And in that place, that place of incense, that includes praise. That's a part of prayer. Includes your petitions. We had petitions on our board. If you don't come here for anything else it early, get here to pray for those people on the board. I looked in the face of one of them this, yesterday. This, oh, I can't even tell you. This morning I was, I got up early. I got up before the alarm went off and, and went downstairs. And, I, and um, there was a message and I had opened it up. And it was, it was from a sister. Her name was on the board. And uh, she used to go to church here some years ago and they moved off. But she was telling me, it was this long. She's a young woman but has... But I got diagnosed with cancer all over her body, stage four. And she was writing, well, they're going to do this, they're going to do this. And when they do that radiation, I'm hoping they can give me the oxygen. Cause I can, and I was like, oh, my God. It was like, this could be me. And it just went on and on and on. Well, they think it's here, so they're going to do this. There's so much cancer, they're having to work on her brain or work on the back, her lungs, her kidneys, her knees. She said, I'm hurt. And I, I was so overwhelmed. I just slid out of my chair. I just laid on the floor. 
And these are the words that came out of me, which I just said, I'm going to name this message. I said, Lord, this is beyond me. This is beyond me. As I, locked, as I looked in the face of another young woman, 36 years old, home on hospice, laying there, I get him right. He's, I, it's just beyond me. To try to tell her 11 year old daughter, can you tell her? Can you tell her what hospice means? Can you tell her? That's beyond me. Looking at y'all today, every one of you have a set of issues and problems and things that are very serious to you. It's beyond me. I realize when the doctors say, we're sending you home after one year of clinical trials, there's nothing else we can do. Just we're sitting home in hospice. They're saying it's beyond us. There's nothing else we can do. I realize that <laughs> that's really the only true setup for a miracle. Miracles only are really miracles is when it's beyond man. Right? As long as there's hope with the chemo, there's hope with this, hope with that, you're looking at those things. Those are things that are well and, and they're good and well, but the truth is, a miracle is when it's beyond man. There's nothing else I can do as a setup for a miracle. I'm like, Lord, you can do a miracle here. But this morning, as I was laying there on the floor and I said, This is beyond me, I remembered this part of the scripture where he said, The hope reaches beyond the veil. Because I can sit here in the church and I can have the word, hallelujah, I can have the spirit, I can look and see the light and have guidance and all these things he does, and I can go and I have the, 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 the altar of prayer, the altar of incense that I go, I bring my praises, my petitions, my, my, I can go and intercede like we did today, I interceded for these people, I went to the throne on their behalf, in fact, I said this and I wrote back to her, all I think I could say to the, I'm talking about two women, I'm talking about both of these are there's no hope with the doctors. But I wrote and I, you know, I said, I'm carrying you to the throne. Amen. I was on the ground and I, all I could thought, I just, I couldn't even pick it up. I could just like crawl in my mind and say, Lord, here's Paula. I love her. I remember being here in the altars with her. Here's, here's Amber. I know that I can do that. My hope is in him. That I can reach. Hope goes beyond the veil. What is the veil? Well, here's what separates us. It's the mind. It's the soul. It's what's in the flesh. And I can tell you why I can do that. Because it's what this says about Jesus. Hebrews 10, 20 says, having therefore, brother, in boldness, let us enter into the holiest. What's the holiest? It's the third dimension. It's beyond the altar of incense. It's beyond that. He said, now boldly, we're going to go further than what I can do, what I can say, it beyond what I can read in the word or hear from you, what I can overhear and I can get in the spirit. I can do all this. But at some point, he said, you can go in with boldness to the, uh, by the blood of Jesus, what he did because he paid it, by a new and living way he has consecrated for us that through the veil, that is to say his flesh, having a high priest over the house of God. Well, I didn't finish the other up there in Hebrews 6 where he said that we have a, we enter by hope into the veil. He says, because there's a forerunner has entered before us, even Jesus made with the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's already done this. He went before me. So now as the high priest, I can go further. Now let me say this. Let's talk about that, that high priest thing just for a minute. There's three dimensions. They could do out here, the priests could, they could go in here, they could do the, the light, the, the light, they could do the bread, they could pray, but only one could go beyond the veil, and that was the high priest. And if he went back there and he had anything unclean on him, he dropped dead like that. I'm gonna tell you something. When you get in the presence of God, you better leave everything behind because it's gonna kill it. Oh, slay me, Lord. 
Though he slay me, somebody brought that up. The king said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Do you know what? That's a good thing. Because the only way I walk in resurrection power is something's going to die before it can resurrect. The Bible said us the seed falls, the ground is buried, it cannot rise. It'll remain alone until it cannot multiply. It cannot walk in resurrection power. One little corn becomes a bunch of corn stalks. It has to die. In the presence of the Lord, I cannot live. I had to say, cut my head off. Cut my soul. I give it to you. And I need to pray long enough and sit there and praise him long enough. Pray to him long enough. Talk about other people's problems long enough. And do I finally say, this is beyond me. Now here I am, I'll slide out of my chair and lay on the floor, and that's called worship. The Lord told me you need to tell the church to press, get this, press past praise. Praise is in the second dimension. That's where they sang and danced. That's where they told the Lord how great he was. That's where they had the temple and the harp. That's when they had all those great things and clapping and lifting. But the problem, but what that was to do was to bring you to the place where I surrender. That is worship. That's where I lay prostrate before the Lord. And usually I'm, I can't even say anything. I let the spirit pray for me or I lay there and I moan and groan. He said with words that cannot be uttered. We need to press, press the praise. It feels really good and gets us feel good good and say the point where I don't want to just feel good I don't want to just be moved I want to be changed I want to die I want to bury me I want to say let whatever it is because this is beyond me I don't even know what to tell you anymore it's okay to start off telling him what you need we're supposed to tell him what we need that's faith we're supposed to join together and let our request be made known, he said in the congregation. We're supposed to come together and praise and sing and lift him up in the congregation. But there was no congregation going beyond the veil. It's a personal thing between you and your father. And you only go there because he said, I'm a forerunner. I am the high priest and you're in me and I'm in you. And you need to see yourself like that. And you, so you can go boldly and quit whining around and singing songs. Oh, such a worm as I. I ain't no worm anymore. I was a worm, but now I'm a butterfly. I've been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. I need to walk like it, talk like it, act like it. Amen. We need to remind people of who they are. The Lord gave Sister Kelly a dream very powerful. I'm going to want you to share that with the church. But he said, all you need to do is straighten the crown. If we just straighten people's crown, all of a sudden everything started working. The Bible says, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added. In other words, it's the first things first, guys. We need to get order. And he didn't just say, seek the Lord. No, he said, seek his kingdom. Amen. Kingship. That means you are Lord, you are king, and I am not. You're not just my savior. Oh, save me. No, you're king. You're Lord. And this is beyond me, but it is not beyond you. With man, things are impossible, he said, but with God, all things are possible. That's the only way I have hope. That's the only way I have hope for Paula. It's the only I have hope. And we know it's not only hope in this life. He said, if we only had hope in this life, only we'd be most men most miserable. That's what the apostles. In other words, my hope is not just I'm going to keep living here. I'm going to tell you, it's a shortcut to get out of here. Let me tell you something else. But it's never been the plan of God. This has never been about getting you out of here. Uh, I was going to start with this. I might as well just see where we are. We are at. You all right? Are y'all interested? I didn't hear any amens out there. <laughs> it's first things first. You're going to have to get the order. And you're going to find it in here. I just told you about the tabernacle. But I'm going to go back to what the Lord told him to start with. Let me, let me say this about that. Before I forget this. The order of the tabernacle. Let's go back to that because this is the order. You enter in with Jesus, right? You, believe, you know he made the way. It's all him. I don't care who you are, where you are. It's just there. He's already done that. The door's open for everybody. He's already paid that price. It's in there. But the outer court, he said, enter into his gates. This was David talking. David said, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Step one. Then you go a little further into his courts with praise. But that's as far as David went. He didn't talk about third dimension. Because third dimension hadn't been opened up yet. Only the high priest could go there. David couldn't go there. But here's the deal. The first one was Thanksgiving. I don't want to skip that. 
Thanksgiving is in that. That's when I look at the cross. I say, thank you, Lord, what you did for me and what you did for the world. Thank you, Lord, in my baptism. That's Thanksgiving is all in that realm. It's me. It's what you've done for me personally. It's really, it's, 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 it's the most shallow, but that's where we start with all of us. You helped me pay my bills. <laughs> you healed me from COVID. You did this. And it's okay. You start there. Can you just start with Thanksgiving? Amen. It'll change your prayer life. Amen. You see, he's told us to pray without ceasing. And so that's a daily prayer. I'm supposed to be constantly being thankful. Amen. Don't skip that. I can't skip that. The first thing he said is being thankful. Being aware of your gracious, loving God and what he's already done for you. We should live a life of gratefulness every day. That's not about Thanksgiving. It's every day. Get up and be grateful and thank your Lord. Before you start to enter in prayer, just go ahead and start thanking him. Then you go into the second. I mean, that's where you end up praising him and you got the word and all those things. It's praise. It's in the second dimension. But there was a third which was going to go beyond the veil, which is, is that thing. David could not go there because he wasn't high priest. But now Jesus said, now I've gone before you. There's one. I've done it once for all. So everybody can now go into that third dimension. We are now in the high priest, and he's in me. We come boldly. David, now we have the third dimension. And even when Jesus, the, well, on the cross, what did Jesus do on the cross? What happened when he died? The Bible said the veil in the temple was tore from top to bottom. Not, man, not bottom to top. They could say, well, the man tore that. No, it was from top to bottom. God himself ripped that physical veil in that temple to show you there is no more separation. There's no separation. Now that's the garden. We have access back to the garden. I know I'm saying a lot, but you need to get this. This is, this is, a, this is one, two, three. This is that praise. Th this is that thanksgiving. This is this praise. It's simple, but there's a lot to all that. But everyone, but then it takes you into worship. You've got to get beyond church, guys. And this is what you and him do. It can be in the middle of the people. It can be in your house. It can be right in the middle of song. It can be in, in, beside your bed. It can be what I did this morning because I was so overwhelmed. When I was reading that message, that she'd got up in the middle of the night. It said three hours ago. This, she was in the middle of the night writing that. While I was sound asleep on my new mattress, she said, just pray that I get some pet relief. That ripped my heart. I was able, though, to slide on the floor and go because I know who he is, that I'm in him and he's in me. If you don't know that, you won't walk in that. You'll have condemnation and lies of the enemy that that's for the preacher or that's for the holy. holy. Though the holy is you, he's already prepared the way. Because he's got something for you to do. They didn't go in there and stay in there. Now, there's going to be a day we're going to get beyond this flesh, which is called death, and we just ripped that old veil. I watched Brother Art rip that veil off, and he's in heaven today. That's the final freedom. <laughs> but let me tell you something. While you're here, this is not about getting out of here, so you might as well mark that one up. Amen. Religion taught us this is all about getting to heaven someday. It was getting to heaven and missing hell. We made that the, the, uh, the, the whole project the whole purpose of God that's not the purpose of God that takes yourself what's the purpose of God he said I saved you according to my purpose and my grace and Jesus in the 17th chapter of John his last prayer at the table I've talked about this pretty in depth one of my last two messages of the year that the table John talked about what happened and Jesus ends his night with his brothers with his his disciples with a prayer to the father and he said, these words, John 17, 1, these words spake Jesus. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. He said, okay, here I am, Lord. I've done this thing. He goes on down there. He says, I, I've, I've glorified you on earth. I finished the work which you have gave me to do. He ain't gone on the cross yet, but he's already said it's finished because he's already, he's already going outside time. See, he's already rising up in the spirit. He could see I'm, I'm going to make it through the cross. He knew he saw the whole picture. He said, so now I'm fixed to go. And in, the, in that, that for, fourth verse, he says, I've glorified you. It's finished the work I've done. Now I've, I've done it. Okay. And he go in here and he says, now I've manifest your name to the people. And now he says, uh, in verse 9, he says, now I pray for them. These 12. Now it's 11. One of them's already took off. Jo Judas has already gone to betray him. He says, I pray for these 11. I pray not for the world, but for them that you have given me, for they're thine. He says, so now I've got these. They've got a particular purpose.
Every single person in this room has got a particular purpose that you're still breathing. You say, I'm important. There's an important piece, every one of you. And he knew that about them. He said, right now, I ain't praying for everybody. I'm praying for these. It's personal. So he talks to about them, and he goes, and he gives them this. Um, and then he says in verse 23, he said, I'm in them. No, he's in 22. He said, the glory what you gave me now, I've given to them that they may be one as we are one. And I'm in them, and you're in me, that we may be perfect in one, that the world may know what you sent me. Well, I, that's not the one I want. Um, he goes on, he says, 24, Father, that they will also whom you've given me, that where I am, that they may behold the glory. Um, that's still not the one. I've got all these underlined. That's my problem. But he goes, now I've in you. He talks to me. He goes, I'm sending them. Okay? It's right here somewhere. I'll sure I'll see this as soon as I quit reading it. But he says, I, you sent me with the glory you gave me before the foundation. He said, now I'm giving it. It was the Passover. He was now transferring the power to you. He said, now, I'm, I'm, as I have given to them, he said, I want you, I'm, you've given it to me, now I am giving it to them. And he says that, um, let me find this here. Okay, 18, I skipped over it. Um, let's start up here in 15. I pray not that you should take them out of the world. There's what I'm looking for. I'm praying for them, but I don't want you to take them out of this world. You're taking me out, but don't take them out. Verse 15, I'm praying that you take them out of the world, but you protect them from the evil one. He said, I'm not asking you to remove them. I'm just asking you to protect them. He said, because you sent me in the world, this is 18, now that you sent me in the world, even now I'm sending them into the world. Guys, religion is all about trying to get us out of this world. And as I went through the hymnal that my daddy, the same hymnal he had, and I have it at my house, and I sing out of it, and I look at the songs that we sing, so many of them were about leaving here. My daddy's favorite song is I'll Fly Away. In fact, it's on his tombstone. It says, Hallelujah, by and by. He was a song leader. It was his favorite song. Everybody knew it was his favorite song. We sang it at his funeral as, as, as they carried him out. We sing a song, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. We sing about, oh, when I get in the glory land. And those are beautiful things, and I'm glad that's there. Thank you, Jesus. But guys, we don't need to be in a hurry about trying to get out of this world. When he told them, he said, I, the Father put me in this world, now I'm sending you in the world. He said, you're not of this world, but you're in this world, and I need you to be in this world while you're here. I need you to operate. He said, occupy till I come. Brother Art loved that scripture. That word, he goes, a military man. He would tell you, I served under the wonderful General Douglas MacArthur. <laughs> oh, he loved to talk about that on Veterans Day. If we're going to go out, we have to know who we are, yeah. and we need to be in order. There's an order God has, and he says, I'm sending you out. The Lord let me know at the end of the year he's sending Christian gathering out. Yep. Now, I hope we have many gatherings. I hope we have more gatherings than we've ever had. We've been having them. People's like, are you having church? I'm like, yeah. We've been meeting every Sunday morning, 10 o'clock. We're meeting up here on Wednesday nights now at 7. We had a gathering at the Cunningham's house this week. It was on there. Anybody could have come. People having home gatherings. There's gatherings all over the place. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you ain't got one, do one. Be one. He said, I need you to go out into the world. If it's on the internet, if it's having a home gathering, uh, a community gathering where you invite your family over or you invite your neighbors over, people you hang out with, let's watch the message. This is a new year. Let's don't miss it because she just preached you some hope and she's giving you some order and telling you if you get in order, you're going to be able to go out and do what you're created to do and that's where the joy is. Amen. There's nothing more depressing and more discouraging when you get up and you have nothing to do but run the rat race. And they feel like the rats are winning. 
It's always just doing it. No, we're above that. When I go to work, I'm not going to work. I'm going to my mission field. Whatever it is, today is my mission field. I might be a homemaker. That's my mission field. I may be working on the railroad. That's my mission field. I might be a nurse. That's my mission field. We start realizing that this is not about getting out of here. It's getting into here. It's now going to the Father and going with thanksgiving and praise and entering into that presence say, this is beyond me. I don't even know what I'm supposed to do today. I don't have to know. Then life becomes an adventure. And now you have purpose. You have reason to get up. You have reason to go on. Because if not, it's all about me. I have this. I got this. I got this. At some point, it stops being about me. And when I start thanking him for what I have, and I start getting in the presence and saying, who do I need to pray for? I'm going to tell you something. It's humbling when you sit there and read what I read this morning. Somebody cried out to me in the middle of the night. She lives on the East Coast and said, I don't have a church. We never found a church. I, as far as I know, they never. But the truth is, she's still going back here to us. She ain't been here in years. What about you? What's your hope? What's your expectation? Get in order. Amen. You don't need anybody controlling you. Nobody telling you what to do. You got the Holy Ghost inside of you. It's beyond me. It's beyond you. Let's quit trying to figure this out in the soul realm. If we're just, we'll just play church. We'll just do church. Well, that's good. That, you know what that represents? The other three is Egypt, wilderness, promised land. He delivered them. They got let out. They're not in bondage. Hallelujah. He set me free. Oh, he set me free. Well, then they got in there and they got really happy with what? Provision. Manna every day. My shoes don't wear out. I got a cloud by day. I got a fire by night. I got manna. I got what I need. So why don't I want to go and face them giants? Well, there's a promise. It's scary. Oh, well, they finally did. Okay, now we're going to go. Now we're going to go across and they said, okay, now let's see who's really busy. Got, who's serious? Oh, you want to take the promises, but are you now going to be serious? Now he says, if you're serious, I need you to do something. I need you to be circumcised. What? Sharp rocks. Get the sharpest rocks. I don't know. But that is not fun to me. Doesn't sound like a fun thing to do. But the truth is they had got out of order. They had stopped doing that in those 40 years. He said, we're going to go back to first things first. That was the covenant of Abraham. That was now me saying back to you that this is what I'll do. That's the cutting. That's the dying. That's the burial. That's the baptism. That's saying now. I lay me down on the fire. I will be the sacrifice. I lay me down and now I'll go. And they rose up and what they do? They went and the walls of Jericho fell. Oh, we want walls of Jericho to fall. But we're willing to do what they said. He said, for me and my, that's where he said, you need to make a decision. He said, for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. The rest of you, it's okay. You can stay in the provision. God loves you. You're his children. People are going to walk around and around having church for years. That's okay. It, it serves its purpose. Praise God, we're his children. But some of you are saying, I want to go beyond the veil. Some of you are saying, I want to press past my flesh. I want a hope that will reach beyond that veil of my flesh that tells me there's no hope. Y'all, the flesh is this mind. The veil is the mind. It's what I can see. But you're looking at somebody and they're dying. Young person. Blood coming out of their face. I don't even know it. Blood, whopping blood. Oh, you better have a veil you can reach beyond because I don't, it ain't pretty. Y'all, we're looking at some ugly stuff. All of y'all have looked at ugly stuff in your life. But the hope is, as I said, it goes beyond the veil. It goes beyond the flesh, what I can see, what I can feel. What I felt this morning was, I mean, I didn't want to preach to anybody reading that. I was like, oh my God, Lord, why ain't you healed this woman? Help me on, y'all feel that way sometimes? Like, Lord, what are you doing? Cut my head off. Press pass. Yes, I thank you. Yes, I praise you for who you are. But at some point, I got to go beyond that. I've got to say, I'm gonna, I die to me. I don't even know what to say. I don't even know how to pray. I want to be in alignment. Because let me tell you something he showed me with alignment. I'm going to finish with this. This was very interesting to me. 
There's a part in the Bible that talks about the five-fold ministry, we call it. The, the apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, pastors. Y'all know that? But there's another place that talks about that. I was interested. It was in, it's in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. He says, God has set. God has set. We want what God has set, right? God has set. See, so God has set. It's his job. It's his plan. In the, in the church, he set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondly, prophets. And thirdly, teachers. And then it says, one, two, three. Then he says, and after that, miracles. Oh, that's good. And I looked up all the translations. I looked at least 15 translations and they all said, after that. Woo. We want miracles? I ain't going teaching what, what the apostles, prophets, and all I can tell you is this is his word. He placed this way. Amen. First apostles, second teachers, third, and next, this is, this is a different version here, whatever, but next. Do you see that? They all say it. Next, after that, therefore, miracles. Healings, helps, management, governments. Y'all need to learn how when you do me, do King James. When brother, when brother James does, he calls it King Jimmy. That's all right. He can have King Jimmy. But anyway, look at there. Healings helps cover his diversities of tongues. All these things that we want, but he said after that. Order. So Next miracles. Maybe we're not getting the miracles because we haven't got the first three in order. I'm ready for miracles. Amen. I want to lay hands on the sick and then recover I want to speak to the drug addict and them be delivered. I want kids to have their addict parents come home and be there for them. I'm sick of kids being torn apart through divorce and disease and, and, and people going to jail and people being addicted and all this stuff that's very real that's around all of us. It's around our families and my family. We all touched by it. Why aren't we being the change agent? I'm ready to be Jesus. I'm ready to talk, stop talking about this stuff and doing it. I don't want to get out of here. I want to get into here. I want to go do what he told his apostles. I've, you've anointed me and I'm anointing them and I'm giving them a deal saying go into the, all the world and give the good news. The gospel's the good news that there is an outer court that he's already done all this for you. Now come. Receive it by faith. Get baptism. That's your commitment so your conscience is clear. I know what I, I know he's taking care of. I can walk in students of life and I can walk and enjoy the word. I can enjoy the spirit. I can pray and bring my petitions before the Lord and know when I'm in that place, all of a sudden the veil rips up my mind, my thoughts, my desires. I quit telling God what he needs to do, what he already knows. And I just go, oh, by the way, here I am. You have your way. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Oh, King, my God is able to deliver us. But if he doesn't deliver us, I'm still not going to bow to you and the things of this world. Amen. I know who I am. Father, today, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord. I, I know the ones in this house are getting this, Lord. I know you've let me know that prayer changes us. Lord, we are to pray without season. It's not changing your mind. We, you already know what you, we, it changes us. Brings us to that place that I can say it's beyond me. Lord, it just changes me, my perspective, so I can go out and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Lord, I pray right now that these scriptures and this word I've taught is now changing our perspective, letting us know we are already seated with Christ in heavenly places. We just need to get there and sit there and say, what do you see, Lord? I want to speak what you speak, as Jesus said. I want to do only what my Father does. Forgive us for doing and trying to build houses and churches and all kinds of stuff. We've done a lot of vain, but you knew our hearts was right. You've honored our works, but Lord, it's time, Lord, to let to us die, let you arise again. Walk in resurrection power of the Holy Ghost. Reach beyond the veil with the hope that's the anchor to our soul that lets me know there's with God, there's nothing impossible. Lord, let us have a, a timely word on our lips, Lord, as we go out, Lord. As we come together, we pray and we're encouraged. And today we're equipped to go out and be the church Lord not just try to stay in here and preach and sing to each other but to go out and take this to the world Lord this needs the hope 
that lies within us. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. Thank you for the inner court that brings us to the outer, the holies of holies. Hallelujah, Messiah. Hallelujah. Anybody that's listening online, let us know your prayer requests. Let us know if this message has touched you. In this house, guys, let me know. Let each other know. There's so much more to this than we can speak today on this. We try to keep it an hour so we, can, we, we don't lose you. But if you're really hungry, you'll, you'll, you'll sit here and you'll listen. You'll listen again. You'll do it. You'll press beyond the, flail, the veil of your own mind, your own, I got to go do this. Get over that stuff. Press beyond praise. Press beyond prayer. Press on into that place where the presence is. Thank you, Lord, today. Amen.